Welcome to EPG Patshala. This paper is the philosophy of law. The current module is entitled Disability Perspective on Key Legal Concepts. The objective of this module is to gain sight of the disability perspective of legal concepts such as humanness, equality, and legal capacity. This module was written by Amita Dhanda at NALSAR. I am Akash Singh Rator from Lewis University in Rome. In recent times, the singling out of person based on the grounds of disability has been perceived as a kind of discrimination equal to other kinds of discrimination, such as racial, caste, or um, gender discrimination. The making of space for allowing those against whom we discriminate has been institutionalized through various kinds of affirmative action. In terms of disability, the key a moment for introducing the proper legislation to prevent discrimination of the disabled is by incorporating the disabled perspective into the normative conception of law. We have predominantly legislated regarding disability from a perspective of non-disabled, but the objective of this module will be to introduce the disability perspective in place of the non-disability perspective, and then to re-examine the core legal concepts in the light of this new perspective. Persons with physical, mental, sensory, or intellectual impairments have been viewed as persons with ultimately deficient bodies and deficient minds. This deficiency has made them the objects of charity. Now, being the objects of charity, means that you are subject to the will of those who wish to donate. In contrast to this, the jurist and legal philosopher John Finnis makes a case for claim rights, and he holds that the world would be morally poorer without them. Now, what is the difference between being an object of charity and having claim rights? Well, even where persons with disabilities were seen to have a right, for example, a right to welfare, this right couldn't be demanded without embarrassment, without shame. And being able to claim a right without uh, embarrassment or shame is the foundation of a right being a right. So what Finnis has suggested is that we should reconceive what uh, is owed to the uh, people who are disabled, not on the basis of what we are just charitably willing to give them, but by contrast, we should reconceive our fundamental rights as rights that they have a legitimate claim to. Now, the early initiatives on disability rights can be seen in the 1971 UN Declaration on the Rights of Mentally Retarded Persons. This adopted a very con concessional model of rights as it only wanted mentally retarded persons to be provided rights, and I quote, to the maximum degree of feasibility so it's suggested in 1971 by the United Nations that um, so-called mentally retarded persons, that was the nomenclature in use at the time, so-called mentally retarded persons should be able to enjoy the same rights as others, but only to the maximum degree of feasibility. So this is a very weak uh, uh, sense of, of rights. It certain, certainly doesn't satisfy John Finnis's conception of a claim right, which is robust and on an equal par with every other human being. In 1975, the UN adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Disabled Persons. Now, this sought self-reliance and non-discrimination, but it sought these not in absolute terms, but once again in somewhat relative terms. Some equalization rules were initiated in 1993, which mentioned civil and political rights, but it primarily pressed for negotiable social economic rights. So what's the difference here? The difference is that a claim right is grounded in what a, a judiciary can adjudicate. In other words, my freedom is impaired by this law. A judge can simply look at the facts of the case and determine, yes, indeed, my freedom was impaired. But when it comes to social economic rights, these are more difficult to adjudicate. How can we say that my right to 
employment was impaired because states have the obligation for civil and political rights to ensure that they are implemented, but the latitude given to states to implement social and economic rights is very, very wide. What does a state need to do to ensure that people's right to work isn't violated? Well, a judge has a great deal of difficulty in deciding whether the state has done enough or not done enough. Since the equalization rules put forward in 1993, think of the rights of the uh, disabled that were, were um, put forward in 1971 and 1975, think of them more in terms of social and economic rights. It makes them very difficult to elevate to, to that level of claim rights, a right where a disabled person can say, my right to equality was violated by this act. So eventually, through the adoption of the disability perspective, this weaker version was um, augmented so that we've established a more uh, promising rights-based regime in terms of disability. The goal of obtaining formal and substantive equality by guaranteeing all rights to persons with disabilities on an equal basis was finally put in place in 2006 when the United States Nations General Assembly adopted the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So remember this, the, Conven the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We'll refer to this as the CRPD, adopted in 2006, the CRPD. So what happens with the CRPD in 2006 compared to the 1971, 1975, and the equalization rules set in place before this time? Well, the dominant legal regimes operated on the qualification model. That meant persons were defined as human if and only if they possessed the requisite qualifications. Persons with disabilities, as we discussed earlier, were viewed as deficient, as deformed, as incomplete. And consequently, they didn't qualify, according to the dominant legal regimes, as fully human persons the qualification model had not been challenged by any of those earlier declarations um, prior to the CRPD. The UN equalization rules that we mentioned constituted persons with disabilities basically as equal in theory but separate in practice. So what happens with the CRPD is that we begin to reinvent this conception, this legal concept of who qualifies as a human. The CRPD recognized that disability was a socially evolving concept. By defining disability as diversity, the CRPD moved away from the language of deficiency and toward a language of pluralism, of difference. So prior to the CRPD, we always saw disability as a kind of deficiency. Through the CRPD, this language changed to understand disability as difference. Now, this couldn't have happened without introducing the disability perspective into the process of legal drafting. The disability perspective on the human is an inclusive perspective. This construction of the human should help in rendering visible people with minds and bodies which do not accord with the dominant human prototype. So just take it, um, uh, the simple example, uh, I don't suffer from any sort of physical uh, disability, so if I'm going to define the nature of the average person, my perspective is obviously going to be inflected by the fact that I don't recognize disability in my own uh, life and experience. If, however, the same articulation of what does it mean to be human were presented by a person who is disabled, the outcome is going to be substantially different. In order to regulate or legislate on disability in terms of capacities or equality or other fundamental rights, liberty, if we don't incorporate the disability perspective, the outcome is going to be radically different because we're going to conceive of disability as deficiency as opposed to difference. Now, 
We've discussed humanness. We're going to discuss certain other uh, crucial legal concepts like legal capacity, equality, and liberty from a non-disability and then from a disability perspective. So let's talk about the denial of legal capacity. The denial of legal capacity has primarily been affected on persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. In other words, we think when we have no uh, intellectual or social disabilities that we are normal and therefore enjoy legal capacity. But those people who have certain intellectual or psychosocial disabilities are therefore abnormal and they are denied capacity. This denial usually occurs through three different kinds of formula. The first denial of legal capacity occurs through incapacity by status. That means that the disabled people lose capacity simply because they are disabled. So, in other words, there is no mediating test. Why, for example, am I granted legal capacity? Just because I'm assumed to be normal. As a consequence, the person who is assumed not to be normal, in other words, having a disability, automatically loses legal capacity. This is the denial of legal capacity by status. Anyone who would reflect upon this can see that it violates certain fundamental uh, rights. A second kind is the incapacity by outcome. What this suggests is that the status doesn't deprive the disabled person of legal capacity. But the moment that that disabled person makes a decision that we believe results in a poor outcome, we automatically deny that person his or her capacity. There's a very clear example here. You can think of certain psychiatric patients who decide at one moment that they do not want to be medicated anymore. So before that time, perhaps the medication wasn't forced upon them. If we're not forcing medication upon someone, that means that they retain the autonomy of legal capacity. In other words, the decision is theirs. But if they should actually take that decision and say, I don't want medicine, we don't recognize their capacity. Rather, we remove their capacity. We say, well, this person till now has cooperated and taken his or her medicine. But since this person doesn't want to take medicine anymore, and since we know the outcome will be bad, therefore it must mean that this person does not have legal capacity. This person is not of sound mind to make that decision. So this is another way in which legal capacity is denied to disabled people. The third way is functional incapacity. That means incapacity due to an assumed inability. Take, for example, the ability of certain people who are disabled mentally or physically. We don't allow them to engage in the signing of contracts. In some countries, we don't even allow certain uh, types of disabled people to be married. They can't even enter into a marriage contract. Or they're sterilized so they can't produce uh, children. These are radical uh, uh, um, uh, laws that are affected to undermine the uh, sense that disabled people have legal capacity uh, as much as anyone else. Now, there have been efforts made to improve the implement implementation of the functional tests. In other words, scientific studies have been conducted as to whether people whom we think are legally incapable are in fact legally incapable. The results of these studies have largely shown that when we presume the legal incapacity of a disabled person, it is more often the projected prejudice of those decision makers than it is based on the actual capacity of the person whose capacity has been revoked. In other words, it is usually, according to these studies, prejudice that determines whether we grant capacity or remove capacity from disabled people rather than their functional processes of whether they can make rational, self-interested decisions. So due to the fact that this presumption of incapacity was due to prejudice, it makes it quite clear that the pronouncements of incapacity 
are, are being made from a non-disability perspective, right? It has to be so. It is the non-disabled person who has certain prejudices assuming that the disabled person cannot have legal capacity either by status or by outcome or by uh, lack of uh, functional ability. If we introduce the disability perspective, then the results change altogether. And as we had mentioned, the disability perspective uh, alters our um, understanding of these key legal terms like legal capacity. So let's talk about then the disability perspective on legal capacity. What has happened with the introduction of the disability perspective is that the denial of legal capacity on prejudicial grounds, um, like the presence of a particular impairment, has been challenged in law. The CRPD sought universal recognition of legal capacity for all persons with disabilities. So rather than having this prior condition of assuming that people with disabilities have no legal capacity unless they can prove that they do, this has been inverted through the disability perspective so that everyone through the CRPD is assumed to have legal capacity unless they prove that they do not. Disability informed perspective also challenged the myth of independent autonomous human functioning by recognizing the human need for support. In other words, the disabled position articulated that, yes, I need support, but so do you. Every single human being, whether disabled or not disabled, can only survive in society through a support system. So why is it that the non-disabled person denies his need for a support system and indicates the, the need of the support system of the disabled person as the defining characteristic of that person? Legal capacity has been reconstructed through the disability perspective by combining human agency and interdependence. Now, a non-disabled person can only uh, exercise his agency due to interdependence. I, as a non-disabled person, rely on a social, an economic, and a political network in order to exercise my agency. These are all interdependence. I require support support of my family, various other kinds of support. Now, since the disabled person has pointed out that he or she is not the only one that operates his agency in relation to interdependence or needs support in order to live a, a fruitful life, the disability perspective, which has been taken up through the CRPD, shows us very clearly that we need to reconsider this um, our attitude towards the disabled in terms of difference rather than in terms of deficiency. After all, what has the disability perspective shown us other than the fact that each of us, taken independently, is deficient? After this discussion on legal capacity and uh, on humanness, we move on to the uh, third concept that we revisit in the light of the disability perspective, and that is the dilemma of difference in terms of the concept of equality. Now, the application of equal norms to unequal groups could be equality in its abstract or universal sense, in a formal sense, but that's not substantive. What affirmative action initiatives do is they allow unequal people to enjoy a certain advantage in order to secure substantive equality and not just have a declaration of formal equality. So how can we have formal equality before the law when those of a particular gender or race or class, or if they're disabled, cannot even enter the law courts? So substantive equality is achieved or, or, or hoped to be achieved through various affirmative action initiatives. Substantive equality addresses the inequality experienced by a group, but individual exclusion remains largely unaddressed. So the principle of reasonable accommodation has been brought in in an attempt to solve this problem of uh, substantive equality. So this idea of reasonable accommodation of difference is that it's an attempt to allow spaces, public spaces, services, 
rules and procedures to be customized and tailored in order to accommodate the particular differences of the indiv individual person, in this case, the individual person with disability. The objective of the principle is to strive towards equality of outcome to the maximum extent possible. Equality of outcome. In other words, not just formal equality, but that the outcome after this um, uh, practice is uh, attempted to be enjoyed is um, substantively uh, tending towards equal. Since only accommodation which is reasonable is acceptable, this necessarily excludes persons who seek more than reasonable accommodation. So built into the very name is a kind of prohibition of asking for more accommodation than is reasonably able to be uh, put forward, especially as the determination of reasonableness cannot be done by the, the person seeking the accommodation, but rather by the person providing it. So if I need some sort of accommodation, I can propose that the accommodation I need is reasonable, but I'm not the judge of that. The person who's the judge of whether the accommodation is reasonable and permissible is the person who has the duty to provide that accommodation, not the person who claims that accommodation. As a result, this principle enhances participation, but it can't make for total inclusion. So the idea of substantive equality introduced through the disability perspective is that the person who is asked to make a reasonable accommodation must keep in mind this fundamental notion of difference as opposed to disability. We can put it like this. When adjudicating whether an accommodation is reasonable, who should be the people who weigh in? Till now, the group of people who weigh in on whether an accommodation is reasonable have all been non-disabled people. In order to make sure that the concept of reasonable in reasonable accommodation isn't too heavily inflected by the prejudices of the non-disabled about their own capacities, we have to ensure that the disability perspective makes itself um, uh, felt in the definition of reasonable when we uh, try to adjudicate whether an accommodation is reasonable. Is it, for example, a reasonable accommodation that the entryway to each classroom open to disabled students should have ramps as opposed to stairs? Is that a reasonable accommodation? Well, perhaps from the point of view of perfectly able-bodied able walking people, we see this as how can it be necessary? After all, only one person is in a wheelchair. But if, if we were to take the perspective of people in wheelchairs, the position changes quite radically. Obviously, the ramp is a reasonable accommodation because it's totally unreasonable to expect someone to take a wheelchair up a flight of stairs. So the introduction of the disability perspective completely alters our sense of these legal concepts such as, such as reasonable capacity and equality. Now let's move on finally to the concept of liberty. We begin with the mainstream understanding of the deprivation of liberty before we move on to the disability perspective on liberty. The liberal articulation of liberty premises being free as the default state of humans. In other words, the deprivation of liberty needs to be justified. So in the liberal understanding, the default state for every individual is free. So if you're going to remove that freedom, then that removal has to be justified. Generally, deprivations of liberty can only be done in order to protect society at large. Legal regimes have been institutionalized with respect to persons with disabilities, both to prevent harm to others, so this mainstream idea of depri deprivation of liberty, but there's an added element, which is for their own welfare. In other words, um, it's much easier to deprive disabled people of their liberty under the liberal understanding because though being free is the default state and we can only hamper that freedom to protect harm to others, with disabled people we have the added idea that we can also interfere with that liberty to, perfect, to protect them from themselves, so for their own welfare. Welfare-based deprivations haven't been perceived in the mainstream literature as deprivations of liberty. 
from the disability perspective, you can see that that's entirely incorrect. So let's attempt to regain liberty for the disabled by re-understanding our notion of liberty from a disability perspective. Welfare prompted institutionalization would also require fair processes or safeguards under the CPRD. That's already been required. Why is that so? Because the fundamental guarantee is equal treatment with all other uh, uh, differently abled people. So non-disabled people should be treated in the same way as disabled people because disabled people aren't conceived as deficient, they're conceived as different. If welfare prompted institutionalization then is going to be imposed on disabled people, then the very same standards that apply to non-disabled people should be applied to disabled people. In other words, I have um, also got uh, uh, to protect myself from a certain amount of harm that I may uh, uh, effect upon myself. I smoke, I might uh, drink, I might engage in other sorts of uh, uh, seriously dangerous practices, but the state doesn't choose to intervene in all of those cases. And yet, if a psychiatric patient decides that he doesn't want to take his medicine, the state immediately intervenes and claims that this person does not have capacity. The disability perspective says, don't act so quickly. You have to recognize that the welfare idea has supplemented the harm idea to such an extent that the um, disabled person's uh, liberty is immediately revoked, whereas the non-disabled person's liberty is only revoked after a great deal of adjudication and um, deliberation. Now, under the CRPD, the deinstitutionalization of disabled people, in other words, we had uh, for many decades homes and institutions where we would put disabled people against their will, claiming that it's for their own good. The CRPD realized that the measure for determining what's in someone's self-interest shouldn't be so much lower for a disabled person than it is for an able-bodied person. For example, I walk around on the streets uh, smoking a great deal. Why am I not immediately institutionalized in a smoking rehabilitation program? Because I'm acting in such a way that is harmful to myself and others. We don't do that because I'm not disabled. But if a disabled person is engaging in an activity that we regard as potentially dangerous to him or herself, they are immediately institutionalized. So this asymmetry was dealt with through deinstitutionalization processes in the uh, CRPD, specifically Article 19 of that declaration, which guaranteed people with disabilities the right to live independently and in the community. So we could no longer start with the overall welfare idea that we're going to lock up all disabled people because it's in their own interest. Rather, we start from the disability perspective. Everyone with disabilities is just as free as everyone else to remain in the community unless and until certain harm comes to the community as a consequence. That means that we employ the exact same standards for disabled people as we do with non-disabled people before we infringe upon their liberty. Traditional discourses only sought fair process safeguards for entry into institutions. What I've just described, that um, the entry into institutions has to be fair. So since we don't grab smokers off the street and stick them into mandatory rehabs, why are we grabbing people in uh, wheelchairs and sticking them into institutions? The disability perspective showed us that we need to mod moderate that such that the same standards is applied in terms of entry into institutions. But there's a further, even more robust idea that comes out of the disability perspective. And that is in the process of deinstitutionalizing people. In other words, exit from institutions. And this goes not only for uh, disabled people leaving institutions for disabled people, but also for prisoners leaving prisons. What we've learned from the disabled uh, community is that there are certain standards of preparedness that need to be put into place in order to ensure that exit from institutions is done in a manner where people can actually enjoy the freedom that we are granting them.
So in conclusion, what have we done? What have we seen through this disability perspective? We have reconstructed four main legal concepts, what it means to be human, what legal capacity is, what equality is, and what liberty is. And we've seen that these need to be reconceptualized in the light of the disability perspective. The needs and necessities of all humans stand addressed if the qualification model, you know, whether you qualify as fully human, is abandoned, and instead a fragility or pluralistic model is implemented as the core of what it means to be human. So once humanness is universally perceived, then we can move on to the next concept, legal capacity. Legal capacity can be universally presumed and constituted from the twin strands of agency and interdependence. Till now, based on the old model, agency was removed from the disabled and they weren't regarded as legal capacity. But when we see the core of humanness in fragility and interdependency and difference, rather than some fit the mold and others are failures, then we can also see legal capacity as a proper use of agency in light of that interdependency that all humans in their various differences are subject to and known as the human condition. The principle of re reasonable accommodation allows for inclusion of very diverse uh, kinds of, of, of people by the individual customization of various norms. So we'll have a normative set of uh, universals, but the idea of reasonable accommodation can always be uh, put in play in order to accommodate a, a wide variety of different kinds of human beings in order to make that norm inclusive of all types of, uh, of persons. And finally, welfare-based institutionalization should be subjected to a high degree of scrutiny. And as we had mentioned, exit from institutions needs to be driven by certain standards of preparedness. We had not had any clue or idea about exit conditions until we learned the disability perspective. So the disability perspective in this particular case can also be seen to enlighten us about new universals and new norms. After all, it was only because of the disability perspective on exit from institutions that we realized fully the need to prepare prisoners for proper exit before they're reintegrated into society at large. So in conclusion, the disability perspective not only gives a different perspective on legal concepts, in some respects, it gives a more adequate perspective of legal concepts because legal concepts need to be universal and they can only be universal if they are inclusive. Thank you.